If anyone bears witness that there is no deity save God alone, who has no partner, that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger, that Jesus is God's servant and messenger, the son of his handmaid, and his word which he cast into Mary, and a spirit from him, and that paradise and hell are real, God will cause him to enter paradise, no matter what he has done. And I do so bear witness. Muslims and Christians share more in common than many people think. Behold, the angel said, O Mary, God giveth thee glad tidings of a word from him. His name will be Jesus Christ, the Son of Mary, held in honour in this world and the hereafter, and in the company of those nearest to God. Before searching for this quote in the New Testament, you might first ask the Muslim, for the quote is from verse 45 of chapter 3 in the Quran. It is well known that Christians look to Jesus in their walk with God. What is less well understood is that Muslims also love and revere Jesus as one of God's greatest messengers to mankind. Verses in the Quran state that Jesus was strengthened with the Holy Spirit and is a sign for the whole world. His virgin birth was confirmed when Mary is quoted as asking, how can I have a son when no man has ever touched me? The Quran shows Jesus speaking from the cradle and, with God's permission, curing lepers and the blind. God also states in the Quran, we gave Jesus the gospel, which is the Injil in Arabic, and put compassion and mercy into the hearts of his followers. As, the world, as world events seemingly pull Muslims and Christians ever further apart, we are in great need of a unifying force that can bridge the increasing gap of misunderstanding and mistrust. That force could be the message of love, peace and forgiveness taught by Jesus and accepted by followers of both faiths. <coughs> Perhaps we could do well to consider another verse in the Quran reaffirming God's eternal message of spiritual unity. Say ye, we believe in God and the revelation given to us and to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes. And that's given to Moses and Jesus. And that's given to all the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them. And it is unto him that we surrender ourselves. The prophet Muhammad himself saw no distinctions between the message he taught and that taught by Jesus, whom he called God's spirit and word. The prophet Muhammad said, both in this world and the hereafter, I am the nearest of all people to Jesus, the son of Mary. The prophets are paternal brothers. Their mothers are different, but their religion is one. When Muslims mention the prophet Muhammad, we always add the phrase, peace be upon him. Christians may be surprised to learn that the same phrase always follows, or should follow, a Muslim's mention of Jesus, peace be upon him and that we believe he will return to earth in the last days before the final judgment. Disrespect towards Jesus is as offensive to Muslims as to Christians. Britain's Muslim community stands ready to honour that legacy by building bridges of interfaith understanding and challenging those who would divide our communities along religious or ethnic lines, whether they be Islamophobes or misguided Muslims. Perhaps we have more in common than we think. But we need to acknowledge that Muslims and Christians do have some differing perspectives on Jesus' life and teaching, which I will mention in a few moments. Political correctness must not mute the open recognition of these differences. But Jesus' spiritual legacy offers an opportunity for people of faith to recognise their shared religious heritage. But first I would like to share with you something of my own background. In my mid-twenties, I had become a rather rigid evangelical Christian. I, I don't mean all evangelicals are rigid, I was rigid. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had acquired some very Islamophobic views, and I started to boycott my local halal shop in London because the men had beards, and so must be nasty militant types. Um, they <laughs> They turned out to be nice Shia brothers, and I do shop there. I took a serious interest in Islam. I read the Quran from cover to cover in English, 
and unannounced I walked into my local mosque in Regent's Park in London. The brothers there were very kind, easily spotting an English guy who had no idea where to go. I set myself a three-month time limit to learn all I thought I needed to know about the reality of Islam, and then I would move on. I aimed to discover if Islam was really a religion of terror, hostile to Western civilization and humane values. I decided to look into Islam as objectively as I could. I wanted to undertake this inquiry for myself, away from the influence of the media. At the mosque I asked many questions, and I even argued against Islam in the mosque, actually. What was Islam really like? I remember asking Yusuf Islam what he thought about 9-11. Curious to know what a prominent Muslim would say about that event. I listened and I learned, but I never, ever thought had any thought of becoming a Muslim. As Martin Luther, the Reformation theologian, is reported to have said of his own spiritual journey, I did not learn my theology all at once, but have always had to, to dig deeper and deeper. As a very conservative Christian, I had thought that Christianity was the only show in town. Now, I had significant indications that other people lived a vibrantly, spiritually authentic existence, but were not Christians, but Muslims. How could I be wrong in my religious convictions? Could I be wrong in my religious convictions? Could I be brave enough to question my most cherished beliefs about God? In this new spirit of openness, I discovered something amazing, Beautiful, strange, and yet oh so familiar, Islam. The Quran came alive to me like the Bible had before. Islam's great secret, unknown to most in the West, is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This man's life and teaching came to me as a complete surprise. What an amazing man, a real prophet of God. It was mind-blowing stuff. I said my shahada. Islam is basically a simple religion of one God that I find both inclusive and pluralistic. Looking at the world anew as a Muslim, I found correspondences which I had not noticed before. And ex for example, I noticed that William Shakespeare had unwittingly expressed an Islamic understanding of God. In The Merchant of Venice, he wrote, the quality of mercy is not strained, it droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throne of monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute of awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above his sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. I have spoken thus much to mitigate the justice of thy plea. Would if thou follow this strict court of Venice, <coughs> must needs give sentence against the merchant there. This merchant of Venice, Act 4, Scene 1. Muhammad, the prophet of God, once said, No one will be saved from the hellfire and admitted to paradise by his deeds alone. When asked, not even you, O messenger of God, he said, yes, not even me, unless God covers me with his mercy. He also said, when God completed his creation, he wrote the following, which is with him above his throne. My mercy takes precedence over my wrath. Now, was Jesus a Muslim prophet? Muslims believe that Jesus and the Jewish prophets were Muslim too, in the sense that the word Muslim means someone who completely submits his life to the will of God, which is what the Arabic word Muslim means. 
but we do not believe that the Prophet Muhammad was greater than Jesus. This is not taught in the Quran, which states quite clearly that Muslims believe in all the Prophets and makes no distinction between them. As it says, we believe in God and in the revelation given to us and to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob and the tribes. We believe in all that was given to Moses, Jesus and all the other messages from the Lord. We make no distinction between them. To God alone we surrender. But we believe that different prophets had different missions. According to the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus told a Gentile woman, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Muhammad, upon whom be peace, is told by God, We did not send you, but as a, as a mercy to all the nations. The English Muslim writer Guy Eden, who read history here at Cambridge, beautifully summed up <coughs> the Muslim perspective on the three Abrahamic religions. In the Muslim view, Judaism nationalised monotheism, claiming it for one people alone, while in Christianity, the person of Jesus, as it were, eclipsed the Godhead, as the sun is eclipsed by the moon. Or again, Judaism stabilised this monotheism, giving it a home and an army, but at the same time confiscated it. Christianity universalised the truth, but diluted it. Islam closed the circle and restored the purity of the faith of Abraham, giving to Moses and to Jesus positions of preeminence in its universe. The great Islamic scholar Ibn Taymiyyah, who died in AD 1328, maintained that Islam combined the Mosaic law of justice with the Christian law of grace, <coughs> taking a middle way between the rigours of Judaism and the mercy of Jesus. And he said that while Moses had proclaimed God's majesty and Jesus his goodness, Muhammad proclaimed his perfection. In the same context, it is said that Jesus revealed what Moses had kept hidden, the secrets of the divine mercy and the richness of the divine love, and that Islam finally brought everything into the perspective, into the, in the light of total truth. In conclusion, I would like to share with you that recent studies have demonstrated the extraordinary convergence between the historical picture of Jesus produced by biblical scholars, some biblical scholars, and the Jesus of the Quran. This similarity is explored in two significant recent works by New Testament scholars. Both celebrate this remarkable correspondence. Jeffrey J. Butts is Professor of World Religions at Penn State University and an ordained Lutheran minister. His book is entitled The Brother of Jesus and the Lost Teachings of Christianity. I highly recommend this book as it gives a credible portrayal of the earliest church in Jerusalem. The other work is by Christian scholar James Tabor, Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina. His book, The Jesus Dynasty, is a study of Jesus and the New Testament. Tabor's comments are a fitting conclusion to my talk. He says, Muslims do not worship Jesus, nor do they consider him divine but they do believe that he was a prophet or messenger of God, and he is called the Messiah in the Quran. However, by affirming Jesus as Messiah, they are attesting to his messianic message, not his mission as a, as a heavenly Christ. There are some rather striking connections between the research I have presented in the Jesus dynasty and the traditional beliefs of Islam. The Muslim emphasis of Jesus as messianic prophet and teacher is quite parallel to what we find in the earliest historical sources. To be the Messiah is to proclaim a message, but it is the same message as that proclaimed by Abraham, Moses, and all the prophets. Islam insists that neither Jesus nor Muhammad brought a new religion. Both sought to call people back to what might be called Abrahamic faith. And this is precisely what we find emphasised in the New Testament book of James. Like Islam, the book of James, and the teaching of Jesus, emphasise doing the will of God as a demonstration of one's faith. Also, the dietary laws of Islam, as quoted in the Quran, echo the teaching of James in Acts 15, almost word for word. And then table quotes the Quran, abstain from swine flesh, blood, things offered to idols, and carrion. 
The Christianity we know from our earliest sources represents a version of the Jesus faith that can actually unite rather than divide Jews, Christians and Muslims. If nothing else, the insights revealed through an understanding of the Jesus dynasty can open wide new and fruitful doors of dialogue and understanding among these three great traditions that have in the past considered their views of Jesus to be so sharply contradictory as to close off discussion. Finally, the Quran calls for a common word between Muslims, Jews and Christians. It says in English, I don't know the Arabic, O people of the scripture, come to a common word between us and you, that we shall worship none but God, that we shall ascribe no partner unto him, and that none of us shall take others for lords beside God. And if they turn away, then say, bear witness that we are they who have surrendered unto him. Amen.
Jesus did not live on this earth in order to create something called Christianity. Jesus lived, preached, healed, suffered, even as a Christian, died and rose again, so that human beings might think again, might turn around, repent, in the literal meaning of the Greek word turn around. They might think again about who they were and about who God was. When challenged about what the great commandment is by one of his critics, Jesus replies, the most important commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second commandment is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Jesus is not inventing a new religion. He is saying to those who hear him, hear again the words which brought you all into being. The words of God's unity and the imperative of love. It is, of course, that imperative of love which was behind the document, the common word, which appeared some years ago with the signatures of, I think, 128 Muslim leaders worldwide, and in the discussion of which I and my colleagues played a very um, exciting and enlarging and challenging part. But what is it, then, that Jesus is doing in his words and his ministry? At the time, Jesus lived, scholars seem to think. The people of Israel, among whom he was born, were riven by controversy over what it meant to be an acceptable member of the people of God. Was it just a matter of being born a Jew? Was it a matter of keeping all the 300 and more commandments that were interpreted by the legal experts of the day as implicit in the law of Moses? Was it a matter of performing the sacrifices in the temple correctly? Was it a matter of ascetical life and community discipline, like the communities who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? All around Jesus, there are people disagreeing very violently, very passionately, about what it means to belong to the people of God. And Jesus responds to that environment of controversy very simply. He says, you belong to the people of God if you trust the promise of God's mercy. And that's it. So, with respect, I don't think it's just the case that Jesus was speaking to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In those words, he already expands the boundaries of God's people beyond what had previously been conceived. And at the very end of St. Matthew's Gospel, he says, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. So that message, if you want to belong to God's people, trust the promise of his mercy. That is the explosive factor that takes Christianity out of its parent environment in the Jewish world and makes of it a new community without national boundaries. And I think that is the first of real convergence and common vision between us. <coughs> Christians and Muslims believe that to belong to God's people, to be charged with fellowship in the name of God, to witness together to God in the world, that is not something which is the preserve of one nation, one culture, one class. It is something which is open to every man and woman. If you want to belong, trust the promise of God's mercy. Now, of course, when we start spelling out exactly what it means to trust the promise of God's mercy, that's where the theology comes in and that's where the controversies start. Because that promise is not always understood in the same way among our communities. And for Christians, that promise of God's mercy is very closely bound up with the person of Jesus himself. Nonetheless, the important thing is the breaking away from all of those controversies which attempt to tell us almost what conditions we can put on God. 
because very near the heart of the gospel of Jesus for me is his passionate concern to say we do not put conditions on God's call, whether they're the conditions of ethnic identity or the conditions of ticking all the boxes in every possible account you might want to give of how the world of God works. And that is why in the stories in the New Testament, Jesus is distinctively concerned for those people who are convinced that they don't belong and never can belong. Jesus reaches out his hand to those who are ritually unclean, to those who are weighed down with guilt, to those who are because of disability or failure or compromise somehow shut out of God's people. And says, so do you trust the promise of God's mercy? Are you willing to say yes to the yes that God is saying to you? And that is the revolutionary thing about the message of Jesus. So when I come to the New Testament, that is the Jesus I listen and look for. The Jesus who is passionately and consistently in search of, yes, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but also all those who are on the margins and on the edges of their societies, and those whom the self-righteous religious regard with abhorrence. And because of that reaching out to reshape, redefine the boundaries of God's people, we see in Jesus, we as Christians see in Jesus, something of the radical creative power of God calling a people out of nothing making a community out of a scattered assortment of individuals <laughs> laden with guilt or suffering, brings them together into what is potentially a global family, a global fellowship. Now, in all this, one crucial and very interesting factor is the way in which Jesus re-evaluates how people see their own worth, their own acceptability. He refuses to adopt the world's measure of value, but he also refuses to adopt straightforwardly religious measures of value. He simply says, you and you and you are loved by God as a child, and that really is it. But he also says, those who are poor, those who are despised, those who are not successful in the world's eyes, those who are persecuted, for the cause of justice, they are those who are most in tune with God. Hence, the famous beginning of Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount in St. Matthew's Gospel, blessed are the poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And the poor in spirit means those who are literally poor, but also those who have given up the hope of success or security, and who are deeply vulnerable. These are the people who, if they will believe it, God is concerned to welcome and to weld into a people, a community. Now, I want next very briefly to say just a word about my own response to the Jesus who appears not only in the Quran, but also in Muslim tradition more widely. I rely very heavily here on this beautiful book, The Muslim Jesus, Tarif Khalidi, which I hope many of you will want to read. It's full of insight and full of inspiration. Jesus in the Quran is presented not only as a precursor for Muhammad, but as someone who in his own right is word and spirit someone in whom God's communication of himself comes alive and comes through. And again, as someone who has a very particular role in the last days. Someone who, in a sense, stands as a touchstone for humanity itself at the judgment. And that's perhaps why in some later Muslim writing in the Middle Ages, you find meditation and reflection on Jesus as somehow showing the best face of humanity to God in certain ways. But I'm particularly interested in the way in which, outside the Quran itself, 
the Muslim tradition sees Jesus as an exemplar of poverty, someone who accepts poverty for himself as a discipline and who reaches out to the poor, someone who knows how to let go of the things that make you safe for the sake of obedience to God. And that, perhaps, is one of the most moving things about this tradition. And it's pretty consistently represented in these later sayings. Perhaps you'll indulge me if I can just read some of these relevant sayings. This is from a source in the ninth Christian century. And it's a beautiful, gnomic little saying. Well worth remembering, I think. The day that Jesus was raised to heaven, he left behind nothing but a woolen garment, a slingshot, and two sandals. The exemplar of poverty, of self-renunciation for the sake of obedience to God. The disciples asked Jesus, tell us, which man is the most devoted to God? He who labors for the sake of God without seeking the praise of mankind, replied Jesus. Which man offers sincere counsel for the sake of God, they asked. He who begins by fulfilling his duties before, to God before his duty to men, and prefers the duties of God to the duties of men. And here's another wonderful saying, which echoes in a more vivid way some of the sayings you find in the Gospels. Christ said to his followers, if people appoint you as their heads, be like tails. <coughs> and that echoes the powerful theme in the Gospel story, which occurs when Jesus kneels down to wash the disciples' feet at dinner. And there's another saying, I can't find a reference now, where Jesus says in one of the Muslim traditional sayings that the holy person will serve bread and water to the hungry will kneel down to serve. So the notion of Jesus as exemplifying poverty and service and reaching out to touch and identify with the poorest, that's something which seemed to have got into the bloodstream of the Islamic world in all kinds of very interesting ways. And that, it seems to me, is an enormous challenge to the four billion of us who are interested in and compelled by Jesus a challenge in this world of acquisition and anxiety and obsession with security to think about what it might mean to depend on God, to turn upside down the world's values and to look for those who matter among those who are most vulnerable, and to understand leadership as service if people appoint you as heads be like tails. Something which I think we might very well send on postcards to 10 Downing Street and the White House and any number of other places. <laughs> so, without collaborating much further, I want to say that that area of convergence, that sense of a Jesus who turns the world's values upside down, who invites us to think as hard as we can what we can let go of in order obediently to serve God, what we can let go of including our sense of righteousness, our sense of rightness, our sense of having God in our pockets, which Jesus so pushes back against in the New Testament. All of that, it seems to me, is an immensely powerful challenge for our time, a spiritual challenge for our society and our world. As I've indicated, and as my colleague here has indicated, there are serious points of divergence that continue to divide us. I don't want to gloss over those. I've said already that my beliefs are those of a sort of standard Orthodox Christian about the crucifixion and the resurrection and about the status that we ascribe to Jesus in our faith. But it seems to me that in tackling these matters, there are two things that matter. One is that we should be willing to say, when we're together, those divisive points are an agenda rather than the end of the story. They are an agenda for exploration and discussion and clarification. In other words, it is possible to talk about these things. It's possible to work through them and try and understand better where those different perspectives come from. 
And that means, of course, that secondly, we always need to hear the other in their own voice explaining what they mean. So that when we engage in interfaith dialogue, the worst thing we can possibly do, whether we're Muslims, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, whatever, is to come to the other and say, I know exactly what you mean, but I'll tell you why you're wrong. Rather than saying, first of all, tell me where you're coming from. Tell me what it is about your faith that really excites you, makes you loving, makes you hopeful, and we begin from there. Speaking in our own voice to one another. There are things which we, as Muslims and Christians, find not only difficult, but sometimes offensive in what one another says. For the Muslim, affirmations about the divinity of Christ are deeply offensive and problematic. For the Christian, the apparent denial in the Quran of the crucifixion of Jesus is likewise deeply problematic and potentially offensive. But these are precisely the areas where we need to sit down, not in enormous groups with megaphones, but sit down with one another and work very hard to understand what's going on here. And my most rewarding experiences of interfaith encounter have been when I've sensed, to use a phrase I've sometimes used in that context, when we've sensed that we've seen the face of the other person turned towards God rather than just towards us. Watch the other person pray, watch the other person, listen to the other person listening, and then you begin to see something of what faith means. But I think that is, if I may put it very simply, that is what Jesus, the Jesus I love, would want us to do. Because the last thing that the Jesus, my faith, is interested in is giving people tools and weapons with which to assault one another and batter one another into submission. The Jesus I love and believe in is the Jesus who constantly tells me, watch out for the spirit of self-righteousness and superiority. Challenge yourself at every point as to whether you are open to God and transparent to the will of God. You can't really do that when you're too busy rubbishing somebody else. And that's why I think an occasion like this where we are able to share our commitments, our hopes, and our convictions with honesty and hopefulness is so important. That's a most interesting question, I think. Um, the Gospels are, the four Christian Gospels, are of rather different characters among themselves, of course. So that the Gospel of Mark, probably the earliest, is much more focused on what you said, the, the account of what Jesus did. The Gospel of Matthew, much more focused on Jesus' own teaching in the name of God. And the fourth Gospel, the Gospel of John, perhaps more even than Matthew. Um, 
Jesus speaking for God in a person at considerable length. So, um, it is an interesting question to me as, as a Christian, how, what exactly is the sense of the Injil that the Quran talks about? Whether it's actually a way of talking about the gospel, that is the text as we know them, or about the message of Jesus in a more general sense, not linked to a particular text. And I, I don't know, as a non-Muslim, I don't know the answer to that. Likewise, I think it's a very perceptive, uh, intelligent question. Um, I can speak for myself, I don't, I'm not an Islamic scholar, and I don't represent uh, Islam or anything like that. I speak to Tim Winter if you want a um, scholarly answer, but um, my understanding is that uh, the Injil uh, in Arabic refers to the, uh, the, the book or the message that Jesus proclaimed. It does not refer to the four Gospels at all. And clearly the Quran, uh, as Dr. Williams has pointed out, uh, apparently denies the crucifixion, amongst other things, too much denies his divinity. So it can't be just affirming the four Gospels, it's actually affirming the original Gospel proclamation, the kerygma, as New Testament scholars uh, call it. And I think that's where I see the convergence between what we as Muslims believe and what Jesus originally preached. And I think they're essentially one, as that quote I gave you earlier from Tom and Howard, peace be upon him, the religions are essentially one. And this is where we, we part uh, company temporarily with a Christian understanding, and that is that includes also uh, the Apostle Paul's perspective on Jesus, the religion about Jesus, um, which we do not follow, the religion of the glorified and risen Christ, the heavenly Christ. Um, our, our reading is, I think, is to follow the message of Jesus, the preaching and the teaching of Jesus about mercy, goodness, repentance, humility, caring for the weak, the vulnerable, the poor, which we completely share with, with, with that uh, perspective that you very eloquently outlined. So uh, I, I think the message of Jesus, such that, it, such that it can be recovered from the earlier Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke, is, is very much in accord with Islamic teaching about God, sin, salvation, judgment and so on. That we would, I think, part company with the later religion about Jesus that we read about in Romans and Galatians and so on. Uh, but we don't follow that. We, in a sense, to give the, the headline, you know, but we follow the religion of Jesus, not the religion about Jesus. Thank you very much. Is anyone else? Jefferson famously took a razor to the pages of Christian scripture and cut out the bits that he thought were somehow wrong. Yet he still called himself a Christian. And I wonder, do you, do you have a, an opinion, strong or otherwise, as to where Jefferson went wrong if he was the Yes, there's another quite similar exercise done by the Roman Catholic scholar Ronald Knox, but as a satirical where he uh, constructed a version of the Gospel according to St. Matthew in which he said, there will be nothing to offend anyone. <laughs> it was about four pages. <laughs> and it's all not about an apple pie. And I think that's the problem with Jefferson. Really. It's, it's not even that you have the Jesus who is radically pushing out the, the boundaries of God's people, the Jesus who is um, attacking a particular idolatrous view of God, the Jesus who who proclaims the forgiveness of sins. It's the Jesus who tells you to be good. And that, you know, that's quite important. I mean, you have not like that. But if that's all you have, then you are really losing something profoundly important about just how novel and disturbing the message of Jesus must have been. And I think there are quite a few people in the Jeffersonian tradition who would prefer it if Jesus had never said anything <coughs> more than love your neighbour as yourself. But he did, fortunately, for some people. So I think Jefferson is giving us, well, he's selling us short in terms of the, well, as I said, the excitement of Jesus. Was he a Christian? I leave that to God, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, there was a couple of other hands up. Question. Yeah. Uh, right at the back of the final row. This is for both speakers, I suppose. Um, who were the uh, the New Testament writers? Uh, Peter, Paul, John, Mark, Luke, Matthew, 
discussed in <coughs> divinity classes at a university near here somewhere, I'm sure. Um, uh, there are technical questions of authorship. Um, you, you ask who were Peter, Paul, John, the historical figures in the first century, some of whom knew Jesus during his lifetime, like Peter and John, and some who didn't, like Paul, who had a vision of Jesus on the road to Damascus. Um, <coughs> There is a big controversy about authorship issues. Uh, I think, uh, and Dr. Williams can correct me if I'm wrong, the general consensus is that the four Gospels are not uh, literally uh, eyewitness accounts, nor are they properly written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, um, so, and some of the letters in the New Testament, for example, to Peter, um, are pretty much seen as pseudepigraphal texts, uh, even though they claim to be eyewitness testimony of the Transfiguration, for example, um, they're seen as pseudepigraphal, which is a, a scholarly way of saying that they are forgeries. Um, and uh, this is what I read and understand to be the case. So it's quite an eclectic collection of texts, books, uh, letters, gospels, uh, whatever they are, sort of first century biographies of Jesus. Um, many scholars think that John's gospel is the least historical in the sense of representing the ipsissima verba, the actual words of Jesus. Um, most scholars, I think, here and elsewhere would see the words attributed to uh, Jesus and John's Gospel as an advanced meditation or theolo theologizing on the words of Jesus rather than the actual words of Jesus himself. And most scholars would go back to the early Gospels, particularly Mark, the earliest of all, for the closest approximation to what we can probably gather to be the words of Jesus himself. Um, so there has been a development in Christology, as it's called, the doctrine of Jesus, in the New Testament, it's quite evident, I think. And, um, again, scholars love to talk about that. Um, as, a, as Muslims, we, we don't affirm the Quran in any way. It doesn't affirm the Bible as uh, the word of God. It has quite a dialectical relationship with the uh, previous scriptures and asks Muslims, ask us all to look at the previous scriptures in the light of the final revelation of God, which is the Quran, of course, and to discern therein in these previous scriptures, which words do actually come from God and which are the words of men. Um, for example, in 1 Corinthians um, 7 verse 12, we have Paul saying, I think this about something, about divorce. Um, these are not the words of God. Paul says, these are my words, not the words of the Lord. So um, now the Quran, the voice of the Quran, at least linguistically, as we can all agree linguistically, is God. You may not believe it's God, but it linguistically, the speaker is always God. So the, the texts are quite different um, in their provenance, origin, historical developments, and, and so on. So that was my so. So do you use the Quran as a kind of filter? Yes, a, 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 a criteria. A, a fukhan is the Arabic word meaning uh, like a quality control. If you want a, a expression. Uh, the Quran discerns the. Uh, it is used as our template, our touchstone. Um, by which we discern what is the authentic teaching from God still preserved in the scriptures of the people of the book, as uh, Muslims, sorry, as Christians and Jews are described. And so there's teaching, extant teaching in the Bible, which contradicts the, the teaching of the Quran, then Muslims have a way of discriminating, to use the traditional meaning of that term, discriminating between what we believe is from God and what is from man, and we're invited to follow the former, not the latter. Um, yes. I don't wholly agree, you won't be surprised, <laughs> you know, because as a Christian, naturally, I, I read it the other way around. I, my discriminatory principle is through the lens of the Bible. But the very, very large question that you ask about the New Testament texts, well, let me just talk about the Gospels for a moment. None of the Gospels except St. John's Gospel, the fourth Gospel, actually says on the face of it, this is eyewitness account. St. Luke explicitly says, I've been asking a lot of people, I've been gathering a lot of material together. And it's only in St. John's Gospel that we have those statements, he who tells this saw it, and it's true, we know it's true. So what we have, I think, in the Gospels is a mixture of eyewitness tradition, and there's been a lot of very interesting recent work rather um, strengthening the view that there's a good deal of eyewitness tradition in the Gospels that we've rather ignored. A mixture of eyewitness event and eyewitness accounts recorded by writers
characters whose identity on the whole we, we don't know. Luke was almost certainly the Luke who was Paul's friend. Um, Mark was very likely the secretary of St. Peter. Matthew probably wasn't the Apostle Matthew. The trouble is, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are about the most common names in the ancient world that you can have. So you can't quite pin it down. So a mixture of eyewitness account and reflection. The reflection that happens in any living tradition. Even where, let's say, I have known personally somebody about whom I'm telling a story, there will be ways in which I shape and refine that story. There will be elements in it that I haven't received at first hand, but which I take on trust from reliable other people. That, you know, it's that kind of level. But it's that that makes me a bit wary about word forgeries here. It's not that I think that anybody in the first Christian century sat down and said, I am going to write a book in the name of St. Peter or St. Paul, and I'm going to pull the wool over everybody's eyes and make them believe that they wrote it when in fact I did. That's a very, very 19th, 20th, 21st century way of looking at it. First of all, a lot of the books in the ancient world were in effect the product of corporate authorship. A draft worked over by somebody else, polished, refined, interpolated, and they would still say, well, that's the work of so and so. Because the original impulse, the inspiration, the controlling genius, if you like, comes from a particular person. So to take the letters of Paul to Timothy in the New Testament, very few scholars would say that as they stand, they are exactly what St. Paul wrote. But it looks as if what you've got is notes from St. Paul incorporated into a text that's been smoothed out, joined up, and sort of padded a bit by a disciple of Paul. That's the, the way it works, I think. <coughs> Francis that the Angel was given to Jesus. Is there any evidence, is there any manuscripts that are in existence that Angel was given to Jesus? And if there was a manuscript, if it was in a written form, how could other Gospels like Matthew, Mark, Luke become successful to, to uh, submerge that message and make them successful? And if it is, was oral, that how that was um, transmitted to people, because it says that Jesus was the uh, sign for mankind. So how could that message that completely uh, disappear and false teaching and the other forces became so uh, successful that they were able to spread Christianity almost to the whole world? That's amazing. Yeah. Wow, well, there's about four questions there, and several PhD theses and so on. Um, very naughty and just respond to very briefly what Roman has just said. Um, Professor Bart Ehrman from uh, North Carolina is about to produce uh, his uh, hopefully magnum opus uh, about what he calls forgeries in, in the Bible. And uh, he, he does give many examples which are well known to us. Uh, the author of 3 Corinthians, for example, was caught red handed in the third century producing Paul's third letter to the Corinthians. <coughs> he was uh, suitably chastised. His defense was he did it out of love for Paul. Maybe that's a good motive, maybe it's not, but nevertheless, if he hadn't been detected, uh, he might have, who knows what might have happened to Paul's third letter to the Corinthians. Um, but coming back to, to your point, Luke in his um, prologue uh, mentions that many had undertaken before him to write accounts of the last uh, life of Jesus. There were many other Gospels apparently circulating in the ancient world. We might assume one of them was Mark, but it certainly wasn't the only one. And uh, Christianity. Christianities is the way scholars often speak of the earliest faiths, or faith of the Christians. In Jimmy Dunn's uh, professor at Durham University, who recently retired, his Unity and Diversity book um, outlines the great spectrum of, of faiths, uh, from on one hand a quite orthodox Jewish faith of followers of Jesus in Jerusalem, headed by people like James, Jesus' brother, through to the more extreme Hellenists on the other end of the spectrum, who um, we understand perhaps from Stephen and Acts abandoned the temple worship completely. So th there was a, a variety of different uh, understandings of Jesus, his, his significance um, for salvation and his message. Um, I think Muslims would look to the, what's, who are called the Elianites, and this may be slightly anachronistic.
anachronistic because we know that as a second century group, but we can again trace their theology, their Christology, even their theology back to the earliest uh, years uh, after Jesus, principally through James and the Jewish Christians. And their message, I think, was Unitarian. Um, it didn't view Jesus as God or part of the second person of the Trinity, but uh, as a Messiah figure, a great prophet. And, and there was quite a polemic also against Paul, who was seen as an apostate from Judaism uh, for various reasons. But this is quite a technical area, but I, I think the, the assumption in your question might be questioned uh, on the basis of a whole range of scholars' work. Um, but there, we're talking about a range of Christianities, plural, rather than a, a single Pauline faith, which we see in Romans, for example. Uh, we know from Galatians that Paul, at least in some quarters, was a deeply unpopular man. Uh, men came from James, from Jerusalem, to um, address the situation. And there was various clashes, or even as Jimmy Dunn uh, calls it, a schism in the earliest church between Torah observing Jews in Jerusalem, who followed the law, this is after Jesus sent it to God, and who didn't worship Jesus, but saw him as the, uh, the Messiah, and so on, and others perhaps who, who did uh, ultimately come to worship Jesus. And uh, people like Mark <coughs> who I mentioned, that they uh, and others have often pointed out that the Pauline party, um, the Pauline perspective, actually triumphed. And it's interesting, the New Jerusalem Biblical Commentary, which is the best one volume uh, biblical commentary produced by the Catholic Church, it's used by undergraduates, um, actually says that this original form of Christianity ultimately found expression in, as Islam. It actually acknowledges that. Um, now, I don't have the reference with me, but I, I do assure you it's there, and I encourage you to look it up. <coughs> the original form of Christianity, this Jewish faith, found its ultimate expression in Islam, uh, with the implication of the Pauline understanding of that faith dominated in what became the Catholic Church, and thus the Anglican Church, and today's Christianity, which almost universally finds its source, its inspiration, its theology from Paul. Um, but that's my view, and I'm sure I'm not talking to disagree with everything. The simple answer to the question is, no, that there is no manuscript such as you yes, I should have said that. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Okay. <laughs> um, I think I'd just say, again, we could, we could go on and on about this, but I'd just say that while, yes, there are some latish examples of deliberate forgery of the kind you describe, um, within the first Christian century, it's by no means so clear that anybody would set out to deceive or to supply um, missing material. We know, for example, that um, by the, the second decade of the second Christian century, the range of reference you find in Christian writers of that period to Christian scripture accounts for you know, pretty good correspondence of what we have in the New Testament. There's not, with due respect to Bart Ehrman, who is, I would say, a very modern <coughs> scholar, in this respect, with due respect to Bart Ehrman, that pluralism of early Christianity has been um, rather worked to death in recent years. There's a significant level of convergence around the books that we have as sources quoting from. And I wouldn't want to overdo um, that element of Christianity. So of course there were divergent varieties. The texts they used are um, mostly without any evidence of quotation prior to about 150, 160 of the Christian era. So I'm not too worried about early and clarity there. One of the best things about chairing an event is that you can, without any academic legitimacy, make comments about <laughs> questions that people are asking. And one of the things that I would say as the layman is that I, I absolutely have no knowledge about the authenticity of the Bible. Uh, what I do know is that someone, if someone opens a page of the Bible and me reads one of the parables of Jesus, one of the lessons that he taught, a lot can be learned from that. Uh, and that's important to me, even as a non-Christian, regardless of whether I think that the Bible is authentic or not. Uh, can I have another question? Yeah, the lady at the front. Hi, this is for uh, Rowan. Um, Rowan, could you tell us something about the role that the Council of Jerusalem played? The question is about the role of the Council of Jerusalem, as described in the Acts of the Apostles, yes? 
comes from Jerusalem is the first um, attempt that we know of in the Acts of the Apostles, the account of the beginnings of the church. The first attempt we know of to find if you like, a, a common policy for Christians in diverse contexts with diverse priorities. It's the result of a minor crisis that seems to have arisen as a result of Paul's preaching outside the Jewish world and bringing in a lot of non-Jewish people to the Christian fellowship. So the question is, when people become Christians, do they have to become Jews? Do they have to be circumcised and enter the Jewish community in that way? Or is there another way of creating a common discipline for Christians? And that's where the dietary laws that were mentioned earlier come in as a sort of holding operation for giving Christians, both <coughs> Jewish and non-Jewish, a common practice in terms of food laws and sexual ethics. So that's the agreement reached between Peter and James, who we heard about, and Paul and others at the Council of Jerusalem, probably around 45 of the first Christian century, year 45. Thank you very much. We have about five minutes left. Uh, we'll go to the gentleman right at the back. It's in the room. Uh, I wanted to give us a brief overview of the core message. Loaded question, really, isn't it? <laughs> um. As I see it, the core of the message of Jesus is rather what I was trying to articulate earlier on. It is if you want to be incorporated into the people of God, the family of God, if I trust the promise of God's mercy and come into that community, um, which corporately trusts the mercy of God. Um, I could say more about that, but I think that's the core message. As I, I, I really risk um, getting things badly wrong here as a non-Muslim, but it seems to me that very near the heart of what Muhammad is pronouncing in the Quran, in the name of God, is a profound rejection of any kind of idolatry, any kind of mixing of God with what is not God, and therefore a sweeping denunciation of all those ways in which in paganism and in some forms of Christianity at the time, people were mixing up God and what was not God, and turning to a plurality of divine beings and spirits for help when they ought to be depending on and submitting to God alone in his majesty. As I've already said in my opening presentation, as Muslims we do not believe that there is any fundamental um, differences at all between the message of Jesus and the message of Muhammad, peace be upon them both. I'd like to perhaps focus on one or two commonalities which <coughs> raise interesting questions for all of us, Christians and otherwise. Um, as Muslims, uh, we, we do not believe that we have to either sacrifice an animal, like a goat or something, to receive forgiveness of our sins, nor do we believe that uh, a man or the God-man or God has to die for us before God can forgive us our sins, uh, either substitutionary atonement or as a price to be paid. Um, in Islam we believe that God is the most merciful, the most forgiving, and therefore uh, is willing, eager to forgive us our sins. And repentance, tauda or metanoia in Greek, is key to that relationship, a restored relationship with God. And this is finds illustration, for example, in, in uh, Luke chapter 15, the famous parable of the prodigal son, where the, the son goes away and, and uh, uh, leaves the father who symbolizes God, and, and the, the son symbolizes the sinner, uh, and he uh, abandons um, you know, decent morality and God and everything else. The father welcomes him back when he returns to, when he returns home, uh, and, and welcomes him back and puts a ring on his finger and has a party. There is no blood sacrifice required uh, in that teaching. <coughs> Um, and, and that, of course, is the same for Islam. And another interesting indication would be Luke chapter 18. How are we justified before God? And it's an interesting question. How are we made right before God? How are we forgiven before God? And Jesus' parable of the, the tax collector and the Pharisee. The tax collector is the bad guy who, who beats his chest and says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then the Pharisee, the, the holy man, the religious man, if you like, 
and that culture says, well, thank goodness I'm not like this uh, disreputable character, and I fast, I pray, I'm a good chap. Um, but Jesus said, the former man, the tax collector, he went home justified before God. But why did he go home justified before God? Had he sacrificed in the temple? Had he said the right formulaic prayer? Had he been a good Jew? No. Jesus said, whoever humbles himself will be exalted, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And I could quote to you numerous hadith which say exactly the same thing from a Muslim perspective. So as again we see this convergence correspondence between the teachings of Muhammad and the teachings of Jesus, over against perhaps, against controversial, against the teaching of Paul, who made a religion of Jesus. We believe in the religion of Jesus, not the religion about Jesus. So that's my view. We have time for one final question. Uh, I can feel the tension. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is for all gentlemen. Um, the most recent census revealed a decline in affiliation to Christianity in Britain. If we couple that with Michael Gold's ever changing stance about education, it reveals a, a decline and a reverence uh, for religious studies as an academic subject. What then do you see as the future of? I really deplore the way in which religious studies have been marginalised in secondary education. And um, the last few years, we've often been in discussion as a church with government agencies and the Department of Education to, to push this point. And it does seem to be the, the stupidest possible time in history to stop people being interested in religion, never mind the, the basic issue, which I do think is rather important, but it's truth. There's also the fact that in the world as we now inhabited. Religion is not less but more important than ever as a factor in understanding how human beings work. So I just think we're in a profoundly illiterate and insensitive situation culturally about that. What can we do? Well, the fact is that at grassroots level, people do have an appetite for interfaith understanding, and very often people will explore and discover more about their own faith when they're involved in interfaith discussion, which is one reason why um, the Church of England the last 10, 15 years has so actively promoted and encouraged interfaith encounter as a way of drawing out of Christians what they believe more fully. So often I've been in groups in the North of England or in South London and listened to Christians say, it's really put me, you know, put me on my metal. I really have to think what I, what I actually believe and learn how to <coughs> defend it and, and talk about it intelligently. And I guess a good many Muslims would say the same. So I'm all for local communities promoting interfaith dialogue as a means of raising the level of religious literacy among congregations. I don't think we've lost the battle culturally, but um, we could do with a few more allies in high places, I'd like to say. <laughs> says, um, this is uh, not my field, um, but I, I was just, just to echo, uh, religious education, as it's called, is so fundamental to the formation of children in, in good, wholesome, godly values, uh, and uh, morality, uh, and also to, to be a good citizen in our, in our culture, which is, Lord Williams says, is acquisitive and selfish, uh, and you know, radically uh, feels insecure about its uh, place in the world. Uh, and religion in general, but certainly in, in, in schools, can play a key role in making us uh, better people, let alone connecting us with the truth about who we are uh, as creatures of, of God. Thank you. thank you very much everyone for coming and thank you to our two speakers for gracing us with their presence. <coughs> In conclusion, I suppose I would say that we face what some have termed an aggressive secularism in society today. And the last question, I think, was based on that. In modern times, faith is more under the spotlight uh, and questioned more than it has ever been in history. Naturally, there are differences in the beliefs of different faiths. But I think that our shared conception of Jesus should unite us in spreading moral values and altruistic behavior throughout mankind wherever we can. I am firmly of the belief personally, and I think the speakers would agree 
that Jesus, even in this age of secularism, has as much of a role to play today as he did 1,000 years ago and as he did 2,000 years ago when he first came. And I think that's important and we need to recognize that. And I hope as we continue spreading the moral teachings of Jesus, not just now, but in a thousand years to come. Tomorrow, Explore Islam Week goes to the Cavonia Center in the Stephen Hawking Building. Incidentally, where I live, but that's not too relevant. Um, <laughs> Adam, Dean, Adam Dean will be speaking about the topic, Is God Merciful? That's tomorrow at 7.30, uh, Stephen Hawking Building, Gunville and Keys College. I'd like to thank both of our speakers uh, sincerely for coming. We hope to see them again very soon. Uh, and that's the last thing I have to say to you. Uh, many thanks for coming, and we hope to see you again soon.